Long ago, in the time of Xerxes I, king of Persia, there was a young Jewish girl named Hadassah. She was orphaned at a young age and raised by her cousin Mordecai in Susa, the capital of Persia. In the third year of his reign, King Xerxes threw a lavish six-month-long party for his officials and servants. On the last night of the party, he requested his wife, Queen Vashti, to wear her crown and show her beauty to all his guests. She refused. Xerxes was furious for Vashti's refusal, stung his pride. His officials advised him to banish Vashti for her disobedience. After the embarrassment of Queen Vashti's refusal and subsequent banishment, King Xerxes issued a decree. Hadassah, the king has issued a decree. All the beautiful young maidens are to go to the palace to be presented to the king. He's going to choose a new queen. All? Persians and Jews? All. Persians and Jews. We must protect you, though. It wouldn't be safe if your Jewish heritage was known. The palace can be dangerous. We shall have to give you a different name. A Persian name. Hmm. What about Esther? That's a good Persian name. Esther, I suppose that will do. It will be perfect. Let's pray before the king's servants come to take you to the palace. O oh Lord, I call upon you. Incline your ear to me and hear my words. Show your steadfast love and keep Hadassah as the apple of your eye. Hide her in the shadow of your wings. O oh Lord, help me to walk in integrity and be gracious to me. Let me walk in your faithfulness and bless your name. Esther was taken to the women's house at the palace and placed under the care of Haggai, guardian of the women. She quickly found favor in his eyes, and he carefully selected seven women from the palace to serve as her maids and moved her to the best part of the women's house. Each day, Mordecai would come to the woman's courtyard to check on Esther. The women spent 12 months preparing for their one night with the king. When each woman's turn came, they were allowed to choose whatever they wanted from the women's house to take with them for their night with the king. They would not return to the king unless he asked for them by name. When it was Esther's turn, she took only what was recommended by Haggai. Esther found favors in the eye of all who saw her. King Xerxes loved Esther more than all the other women. She won his grace and favor, and he placed the royal crown upon her head, making her queen. He declared a royal feast in her honor and sent gifts throughout the land. It was during this time that Mordecai overheard a plot by two of the king's guards. He informed Esther, she told Xerxes, and an investigation ensued. When the plot was discovered to be true, the guards were executed, and all these things were recorded in the Chronicles of the King. Xerxes then promoted Haman the Agagite to be a prince of the land, and the highest of his officials all were commanded to bow before Haman. Mordecai refused. Who is that man? Why won't he bow to me? Every day he refuses to show me honor. It is the king's command. That's Mordecai, a Jew. He will only bow to his God. We'll see about that. Mordecai's refusal to bow to him stung Haman's pride. In his anger, he determined to teach Mordecai a lesson by appealing to King Xerxes' pride. Your Majesty, there are people in your kingdom who don't obey your laws. They're a danger to the rule of order. You must take action. You must issue a decree for their destruction. I will personally pay 10,000 talents of silver to the royal treasuries to see that these people are permanently eliminated from your kingdom. The silver and the people are yours. Do with them what you please. Thus a decree was sent throughout Persia with the order to destroy, kill, and annihilate all Jews in a single day, the 13th day of the 12th month. While Haman and Xerxes sat down to drink, the city of Susa was dumbfounded. O oh Lord, how many are my foes! My soul is greatly troubled. Deliver us for the sake of your steadfast love. 
The queen wants to know the cause of your distress. Has she not heard of Haman's decree of the annihilation of the Jews? He has put a price of 10,000 talents on our heads. Give her this copy of the decree so she can read for herself of the coming destruction of her people. What does that have to do with her? She's queen of Persia. She is a Jew. She has the ear of the king. She must beg his favor and plead for the lives of her people. Esther's servant told her all that Mordecai had said and gave her the decree to read. Now it was the law that if any man or woman came before the king without being called, that man or woman would be put to death, unless the king held out his scepter, granting mercy and sparing the life of the one who entered without being called. It has been thirty days since I was last called to see the king. Do not fool yourself, cousin. You're not safe within the palace. If you stay silent at this time, deliverance will arise from another place, but you and your father's household will perish. Could it be that you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Gather all the Jews in Susa. Tell them to fast and pray for me for three days. My maids and I will do likewise. Then I will go to the king against the law. If I perish, then I perish. O Lord, you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted. They trusted you, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. Abba, Father, look down from heaven. Our souls wait for you. You are our help and our shield. Let your steadfast love be upon us as we hope in you. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Let those be put to shame who seek to snatch away our lives. Let those be turned back and brought to dishonor who delight in our destruction. May all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. You are our help and our deliverer. May those who hope in your salvation say continually, Great is the Lord. What is it, my queen? Whatever you request, I will grant it up to half my kingdom. If it pleases the king, and if I have found favor in your eyes, let the king and Haman come to a banquet to this day that I have prepared for him. The king and Haman did as Esther requested. At the end of the banquet, the king asked Esther again to name her request. She asked the king and Haman to return the following day for a second banquet. On his way home, Haman's path crossed Mordecai's once more. Yet again, Mordecai refused to bow. Upon arriving home, Haman told his wife of both the great honor of being invited to the private banquet with the king and queen and the dishonor shown to him by Mordecai. His wife's recommendation was to hang Mordecai before the banquet the next day. Thrilled with the idea, Haman headed back to the palace to seek the king's approval according to the law. Thus Mordecai told of Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's guards who sought to kill King Xerxes. What honor has been given to Mordecai for this? None, your majesty. Who is in the court? It's Haman, your majesty. Ah, Haman, I have a question for you. What shall be done for the man the king delights to honor? The man the king delights to honor? Hmm. Let him be dressed in the royal robes that the king used to wear. Let him be led through the city on the king's horse while wearing the king's robes and a royal crown. Let him be led by one of the king's most noble princes proclaiming, Thus shall it be done! For the man the king delights to honor. Excellent. Go and do just as you've said for Mordecai. M Mordecai? Yes, the Jew who sits at the gate. He saved my life. Thus shall it be done to the man the king delights to honor. Thus shall it be done to the man the king delights to honor. My queen, what is your request? I will grant whatever it is, up to half my kingdom. If it pleases the king, 
and if I have found favor in your eyes, let my life be given to me at my petition and the lives of my people. We have been sold to be destroyed, slain and annihilated. If we had only been sold as slaves, I would have held my tongue. Who is he and where is he that presumed in his heart to do so? The adversary and enemy is this wicked Haman. Spare me, O queen. Plead for my life, and the king will give it to you. Will you assault the queen in my house and in my presence? Behold, there are the gallows Haman built for Mordecai, who spoke good for the king. Hang Hangman on them. Queen Esther once again pleaded for the lives of her people. The decree issued by Haman and sealed with the king's ring could not be undone according to the law. The king had Mordecai write a new decree, giving the Jews permission to defend themselves. When the thirteenth day of the twelfth month arrived, the Jews defended themselves against their enemies. Even all the administrators, officials, and those doing the work of the king helped them. They struck down all their enemies, including the ten sons of Haman. Mordecai recorded all these things and sent letters throughout all the provinces in court. Mordecai recorded all these things and sent letters throughout all the provinces, encouraging the Jews to celebrate Purim on the 14th and 15th days of Adar, the 12th month. You have turned my mourning into dancing. You have loosed my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness that my glory may sing your praise and not be silent. O oh Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. I've got to go after that. Oh. No pressure, right? I, uh, I'd like to thank the Academy for the honor to present this award today. And the best actor goes to Shepard Vader. Jasper, you did a great job. You guys all did a fantastic job. Super excited for that. And we go from celebrating Purim, celebrating the deliverance of the Lord, to talking about a deadly sin. So, yay. Yay. I will say, and, um, I do understand why people say it's hot out here. Like, even with the AC on. Like, I get it, Brent. Like, it was cool back there, and then I walked out here, and all of a sudden, there was an instant 10-degree rise. So, you have a fan. Okay. All right. All right. Duly noted. All right. Well, as the kids are climbing out towards their class, we can go over a couple of housekeeping announcements with you guys. Uh, tomorrow is Palm Sunday, and Palm Sunday is traditionally celebrated as the start of Holy Week. And in the start of Holy Week is when Jesus, Yeshua, was riding into Jerusalem on the donkey and they were waving the branches. And in waving of the branches, they didn't even realize that they were fulfilling prophecy and all the things that were happening. But tomorrow from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. in Andrews Park uh, in Norman, there is going to be a multi-church um, I think it's called Jesus Make Us One, uh, time of prayer, time of worship, time of outreach, all of those types of things. And so uh, free event, if you don't have anything going on tomorrow afternoon, uh, Andy McDonald and Redeemer Church are the kind of host church, but there's going to be multiple different churches and multiple different people uh, part of that. And so if you don't have any plans tomorrow, that would be a great opportunity to go out and join with the larger body of Christ to celebrate as they kick off their Holy Week. This is one of the years that our calendar is off 30 days from the traditional Christian calendar. And so in doing that, that means that everybody's going to be celebrating Holy Week, and then we're going to be celebrating Passover 
roughly 29 to 30 days from now. I had to count because we start our 28 days of prayer and fasting on Tuesday, and that leads us 28 days into Pesach, into Passover, into the memorialization of the giving of Yeshua's life, the Last Supper, and all the theology that comes in there. People will say it was Last Supper, it was Passover Seder. I, I don't care how you celebrate it. I just know that if he doesn't give his life and he doesn't come out of that tomb, the uh, world's probably a little bit different. So, all right. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to stand here in this sauna today. We thank you that we have HVAC. There's so many people who don't have that. And so, Lord, today we just bless you for the opportunity to be here. We bless you for the opportunity to remember one of many times that you have kept your word and saved your people. And so, Lord, we just bless you. We praise you. May the words that are spoken today, Lord, may they be by your spirit and may they be your words alone, not from me, Lord. And so we commit this time to you in the name of Yeshua, our Messiah. Amen and amen. You have the ability and the gifts to do whatever you want. It is your turn now to change the world. Yes, we can. Anybody remember that? Anybody remember that? Okay, so we've talked about pride, we've talked about lust, both clearly setting to the forefront of our life this conflict between the dual natures inside of us, the one that would be considered the evil appetite, the nature of the flesh, and then the other one that would be the Holy Spirit, God, living inside of us. However, I would say that in a culture like America, our Western culture, we are greatly lacking in the severity of our approach to gluttony. If, if it's not America's favorite sin, if it's not America's favorite sin, it's at least our most tolerated sin. Gluttony, the, the dysfunctional relationship with food and other things that we consume in excess. See, gluttony, we like to talk a lot about overeating. However, gluttony is, is an indulgence in consuming things that are unhealthy. That could be food, but it also could be a lot of other things. We live in a day now where we have a dysfunctional relationship with the gluttony of social media. Constantly. There's algorithms upon algorithms. You don't even think for yourself anymore. I... I didn't fully understand this, but the Defados had shared a movie with me a couple of years ago and like, you need to really watch this movie. I think it was on Netflix or whatever. And it talked about the agenda of social media and how those things went. And so, yes, we do have a food problem. We definitely have a food problem. But we have a gluttony problem that's more than just the consuming of food. It's more than just the consuming of alcohol. It's more than just food or drink. We are two parts. We are physical and we are spiritual. And so what we're consuming in the physical should also be a reflection of what we're consuming in the spiritual. Once again, I told everybody, I'm going to say it every single week. I'm not here to guilt you, to shame you, or to bring condemnation upon you. That's not my goal. My goal is not to make you feel guilty about what you're doing in your life. My goal is to inform you what the word of God says and maybe, just maybe, give you something that you could make an adjustment in in your daily walk with the Lord. Because if, if any of these sins or any of these thoughts are engaged in your daily life, then, then that's a hindrance to the power of God inside you. Whether you like it or not, it, it's definitely a hindrance. Because if you're walking in pride, which the Bible says all of us has pride, so literally all of us, including me, have pride, that there's an area of our life where pride takes over, and by pride taking over, the Lord can't take over. The Holy Spirit can't take over. Same thing with lust. If we have an unhealthy desire towards things that are not of God, because the Bible tells us where our desire should be, those are areas that we take over, not God. Well, the same thing with gluttony. Our overindulgence to never quench the thirst or the hunger or the void. Now, this one kind of hits close to home. And so 
I understand when you start talking about food and, and you start talking about overeating, the immediate thought process is to look at the outward appearance of an individual and make a judgment based upon whether they're gluttonous or not. We could stack two body types up here, male or female, and, and, and naturally in America, it's just been programmed in our mind that, that one body type would be considered to be the appropriate and the other would be considered to be the gluttonous. However, that's not necessarily true because you have to take into count many different factors that are there. One, genetics. How many of you have been driving to work or driving around and there's somebody in their 70s and they're sprinting down the road and they got one of those like backpacks that's got like one of those tubes that I want to do for football Sunday, but they're drinking water in and they're running out. And I'm like, in my 20s, I could have never done that. And it's true. Why is it true? Because up until I was in my junior year of high school, so I would have been 16 to 17, I was six foot and 320 pounds. Now this morning, I stepped on the scale and I was 205 pounds and I am roughly six foot seven. I don't know, I haven't, I'm not sure if I'm shrinking yet or not. And there's, there's that when you get over the hill and you start to like go backwards. And so, I very much understand the sin of gluttony in the sense that just because I was 320 pounds doesn't mean I was gluttonous. But I remember why I was eating and overeating. And it was because my parents were divorced when I was two. I had emotional scars. I had emotional baggage. And so I turned to that to try to heal me, to try to make the pain go away. Well, some of us don't turn to food. Some of us turn to alcohol. Some of us, we don't turn to alcohol, we turn to social media. Some of us don't turn to social media because we don't have social media, so we'll turn to things like pornography or things like gaming or things that are out there. All while, if it's not of God, it's a distraction. And I say that again as the chief sinner because I have a social media account. I have five children. I help coach baseball. There's all of these things that we do on a daily basis that aren't necessarily bad. But there's a line. And that line is different for each and every one of us. So when you're thirsty, when you're hungry, whether it's your physical body or it's your spiritual body or your mental components, Remember that on the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. We talked a little bit last week about the power of God that he tells us in Genesis 4, 7, this is the story of Cain and Abel, that we must master sin. Now for my type A friends in this room, we like to master things. We like to overcome things. We like to learn things. We like to take perfectly fine clocks apart and try to put them back together. We like to take perfectly fine automobiles apart and put them back together. We like to take things and we like to learn how they tick and how they work and how these things, we, it's just who we are. We like to work with our hands. But mastering sin is something that seems to be Fleeting. How are, you, how are you going to do that when all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God? How are we going to overcome the very issues that our flesh has by trying to fix them with our flesh? You see, you never will. It's not possible. Because we talked about this multiple times over. We talked about this internal struggle, what the Jewish sages would call the yetzerah, or the evil appetite. See, gluttony is, is a very physical sin, according to America. But biblically, it also includes the mental, emotional, and spiritual sense of overindulgence of things that aren't of the Lord. We can't fight or fill the evil appetite with anything other than Jesus. Anything. You take your pick, you take your poison, it doesn't matter. Maybe it's Instagram, maybe it's Jack Daniels, maybe it's the best filet mignon that's out there. Take your pick. If it's not Jesus, it's never going to fill it. It's just not going to happen. 
Not every person who's overweight is gluttonous for food or for drink. And when we constantly just look at the outward opinion of individuals, we're missing the very spiritual component. Because if we just talk about gluttony as being a physical thing, we can see, well, this person is in shape, that person is not in shape. Then how does the Bible tell us whether they're spiritually in shape or not? Because there's two components to who we are. What about the person who has an overindulgence of their protein powder? That's never happened. Who laughed, Russ? Oh, I'm glad I can make you laugh. I actually overindulged on my protein powder this week. So, and then my wife was going to send me to Costco because she's in Dallas. But we had more protein powder. So this is why I got into my notes. Like, so thank you for laughing at, at my expense this week. I appreciate that. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. <laughs> it is a double blessing. It is a per miracle. You will have all the protein you need. An overindulgence of consuming something that isn't God. Jesus answered them and said, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, God the Father has set his seal. Interestingly enough, here in John chapter 6, Jesus is being a little snarky. Because all of a sudden, we have the fishes and the loaves. There's a great miracle that happened there, and he fed people with what shouldn't have worked. We had a similar experience last year at the OKC Passover. We had, we had purchased catering from hummus for 100 people, and when it showed up, it looked like it was probably catering for 50. And the Yurdaks are out there praying over it, and they're like, please, Lord, make sure there's enough baba kadush for everybody here. Make sure there's enough hummus for everybody. There's about to be a revolt in here, and sure enough, there was. But Jesus is saying that you're, you're not actually seeking me. You're not actually following me because of me. You're following me because I fed you, because you're full, because you had plenty. We, we see this all the time. It's called keep up with the Joneses. You're not actually seeking after that individual because there's something that they have that you really want. Because you really don't know what they have. You just see from a vantage point. My son, a Lamborghini. He doesn't even know what a Lamborghini looks like, but he wants a Lamborghini because he heard, I think it's KB or one of the Christian rap guys talk about a Lamborghini. So every time a cool looking car drives by, he's like, Lamborghini. It's like, that's a Corvette. Lamborghini, that's a Tesla. Lamborghini, he doesn't know. So in the same way, America has created an entire culture of what you should be. And the church is exactly the same. Can I let you in on the million dollar secret? It's all fake. And the church has been playing along with it. It's all fake. We're going to keep up with the Joneses. Keep up with the Joneses. And yet everybody who keeps up with the Joneses ends up on a VH1 behind the music talking about how empty their life was. Because there was a gluttonous overindulgence of something that wasn't real. And yet Yeshua says constantly throughout his teaching, I'm the only thing that can fill you. I'm the only thing. I think this is important for us to understand from where we come from. Where we come from in our corner of Christianity puts a lot of emphasis on, on again, what we can do with these. And yet, what was one of the first commandments that the Lord gave Adam in the garden? Even before the Sabbath day, it was to protect and to work the garden. And then all of a sudden there's the fall of man. And what happens? It says that you will toil and you will labor and you will labor and you will labor and you will labor. And it was different. I know I'm fast forwarding a little bit to our laziness portion of the seven deadly sins. But God actually said, like, you're supposed to do something. 
man, I'm going to put you in this garden and you're supposed to do something. But when we fall, now this something that we were supposed to do has a whole nother impact on us. A whole nother weight. Well, the more we overindulge in the food, in the drink, in our pride, in our lust, in our social media likes and shares, in our, our, our obtaining of wealth. Everybody's looking to obtain wealth. Wealth is different to a lot of people. We talked about earlier on in a sermon series that wealth used to be time, leisure. And now wealth is considered material possessions. It's, it's tangible. But yet all of the material possessions that are created nowadays are not created to last the same way. Ikea furniture has a shelf life of six months. And if you have toddlers, not even that. But yet I got to go and walk through Northside Christian Church with Brent, and I don't even know when that church building was built. I'm, I'm getting to the point in time in life where I'm having a really hard time judging differences. The other day I saw people walking down the street, and I was like, babe, look. They let their their 13-year-olds walk down the street. I won't let them walk around the corner. And she's like, sweetie, oh, that's cute. They're like juniors in college. I was like, man, I'm getting old. But we were walking through Northside Christian Church and helping Brent and just beautiful things that are happening and just being able to be a part of the, the greater kingdom of God. And that building is like rock solid. Like you're looking at the sanctuary and it's got these beautiful beams and there's just all these things. They don't make anything like that nowadays. Everything's temporal. And Jesus says, don't just follow after me because I fed you. Kind of like you would say to your friend, well, don't just go out to lunch with me because I have money. Or don't just go with me because I have power, I have influence. This is what America teaches us to do. This is why I say if it's not at least the most kind of like ignored sin, it would be our greatest sin because it's involved in every bit of the fabric of this country. I only hang out with you because you can do something for me. I only am a part of this because you can do something. It is transactional. And we've allowed it to creep into our relationship with God. God, if you will do this for me, I'll do this for you. Nobody's ever prayed that prayer. Lord Jesus, if you can just make this happen, I will never sin this way again for five minutes. If it would be your will, because we're being humble, if it would be your will, would you help and bless me through this situation? He's like, yes, I will help and bless you through. I will honor your your request. I'm going to put your face in the dirt, and I'm going to make you humble up. I'm going to make you change. I'm going to make you teshuva. I'm going to make you do something. Be careful what you pray for, because sometimes it gives you what you want. An overindulgent culture. Is this how we operate with the Lord? Transactionally? Transactionally? Lord, you have fed me, so today I will go to church. Oh, church is optional for a lot of people. So we're not, we're not even like the people in John chapter 6 who were out there being fed. Now we're like, Jesus, you fed me, you've clothed me, you've given me hair, you've given me all this wealth, whatever you consider to be wealth. But I can't, oh man, I can't be there on Saturday. I can't be there on Sunday. Ooh, I've got to take my schedule. Mm. Sorry, Jesus. Can, can, you do, can you do April 17th at 6 p.m.? It's transactional. Yet Jesus tells us if we continuously come to him that the thirst and the hunger will be removed. So if we're talking about just a physical hunger, he can remove it. If we're talking about a desire, a lust, a pride, or something that we use as sustenance in our life that is not of God, he also can remove it and replace it. Why is that so foreign to us? 
We're a Hebrew passionate congregation who, who understands the story of the first exodus. And some of the first things that God does when he delivers them, which by in and of itself was pretty cool. Like anybody else seen this, a sea split open? I haven't. I mean, it's pretty cool. Like anybody seen that? Okay. So that happens, but then he starts making food rain from heaven. What? Like, he starts making your provision, your sustenance come. And even then, he's like, well, I only really have, like, one rule. Like, just gather what you need to on this day and don't go gather on that day. They can't even do that. It's like, oh, this man is killer. I'm going to gather as much as I can. And it would rot and it would go to waste. It is literally still the very same thing that's plaguing us today. And I understand because it plagues me too. I love food. I also love when people like me. Never used to. It was so much easier when I didn't care what anybody else thought. But, of course, you know, there's that song, if I only had a brain, well, if I only had a heart, I guess I was the tin man. But when those things start to happen, you do care about what's happening. And so when you look at what you must do for the Lord to be that filling up, the filling up of your hunger, the filling up of your thirst, the filling up of your desire, the filling up of your power, the filling up of whatever those things are, how do we combat it? Fasting. Now, we need to be careful when we're talking about fasting because people will say, well, there's a lot of talk about fasting in the Bible. Yeah, there is. But there's also times where the Lord says, like, you're fasting Stinks. Caught myself. Stinks. I don't want that. Go eat a burger. Because this ain't, I want nothing to do with whatever this is. Oh, Lord, I'm fasting for you. I've got my sackcloth and ashes. Yeah, that's, that's, that's hogwash. That's malarkey. That's not what I want. So, if you can abstain from food... And the Lord will say, that's not what I want. What must we do? First off, we must understand that fasting is more than just food. I say that because we're coming up on the 28 days. And there's some conditions that people have that they should not abstain from food for prolonged periods of time. They might be on medicines. There might be, uh, my son's a type 1 diabetic. If it's not done right, like he could go super low, he could die, all these things. There's, there's conditions that are there. My wife did not fast when she was nursing our children. She would fast from a certain type of food. But that was it. So, so how does a church or a body or a nation come together and fast if not everybody can abstain from the same thing? It's easy. Not everybody's wrestling with the same thing. Not everybody wrestles with the same deadly sin. Not everybody wrestles with the same issue. And so maybe you can't abstain or fast from food, but maybe that's not your issue. Maybe food is not your God. What? Is it social media? If it's not social media, some people in this room are like, Dude, this is why I got off social media back in 2008 when Tom was running it on MySpace. It, maybe it's not social media. Maybe it's, maybe it's the television. Maybe it's drama. We should all be fasting from drama. Easier said than done. There's something we can fast from or abstain from at any point in time. See, the act of fasting and abstaining is to afflict the evil nature of our flesh, and in that affliction, we can be made whole. The affliction of the soul was interpreted by the rabbis to mean fasting, since our nephesh, our soul, can also be translated as an appetite. And since our yetzer ra is framed as an evil appetite, the way to subdue it is to exercise control over it. But absence is not deliverance, church. The goal is not just to abstain from satisfying that evil aptitude, it's ac appetite, it's to actually be set free. 
to have a spiritual appetite that is greater in preference in our life than the physical. How many of you, when you're talking about let's go out to dinner, you're thinking about the spiritual atmosphere that you're going to be in? I mean, I've gone out to some restaurants. I've never thought about the atmosphere I'm going to be in. I'm like, I want a burger. Who's got the best burger? I want a steak. Who's got the best steak? Hey, they have some beef empanadas. I want the best beef empanadas. Now I'm hungry. Dang it. The evil appetite. I fast before I sing or before I I preach because I have a phobia that I'm just going to be talking and just let out the loudest belch. I've let you into the most inner side of my psyche. And so when you start talking about food, I'm just like. Has a preacher ever door dashed while he's preaching? Anybody know? Thank you, Lord. But see, Jesus exposes the spiritual nature of our appetite in other ways as well. Let's listen to his words from Matthew chapter 15. Hear and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth that defiles a person. Luke chapter 6, 45. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of his evil treasures produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. Food isn't a bad thing. Dining's not a bad thing. Going out to eat's not a bad thing. You know, we, we, we had that whole purity abstinence culture where it's like, oh, well, we need to really talk negatively about all these taboo topics because that will somehow, no. Almost everything that we see that we wrestle with are things that God created for a good purpose. God has no problem with you enjoying a beautiful steak dinner. God has no problem with you, dare I say it, he has no problem with you having an alcoholic beverage. There's actually commandments. Now, you should abstain from that if that's, a, if that's an issue you have. Sexual desires are not bad when done right. All the things that we see are things that were created to be beautiful for us that the adversary tries to step in and pervert to make them be your God. And America has a belly God problem. I have a belly God problem. One thing I want you to understand is that God is not the reason why I will spend the rest of my life with a little pooch as a belly. I am. Now, yes, I work out and I fast and I do all these things. I've got my protein powders and Riley found me a a chocolate protein powder and in coffee, it's hard to die for and all these things. But there's consequences for the decisions we make in our life. And with gluttony, sometimes there's consequences. There's a residual effect. Now, thank God, mine is just purely physical. I'm just going to have a little pooch from being 320 pounds. I got some stretch marks. I got some wears and tears on the side. That's my cross to bear. I'll have to do that for the rest of my life. Because I don't have enough money to get surgery to make it go away. And quite honestly, even if I did, they remind me of the time where I needed God the most. And I was looking at him in a carton of ice cream when I was looking for him in potato chips. Some of you, that wouldn't be ice cream, that'd be potato chips. Some of you, that would be on your phone at night. Some of you, it would be at a bar. Some of it would be, I'm a workaholic. Yeah, you can actually overindulge in your work as well. We have a society who is overindulged in their work. They can't even take a day off and meet with the Lord, let alone a day off and stay with their family. Overindulgence and gluttony is many different things, and ultimately it becomes idolatry. You've taken God off the throne of your life, and at least in one area of your life, you put something else there. The teens aren't in this room, but a lot of times at that certain age, there's that little window where they become boy crazy, they become girl crazy, and they'll take God as the primary person in their life and they'll put them down here to maybe number two or number three and they'll elevate that boyfriend or that girlfriend. I can't wait for him to text me. Oh, I've got butterflies. 
And the boy's over there like, can we go mudding today? He's not thinking. God should always be first in everything you do. Your friendship, your relationship, your marriage, everything. This church, if somebody says something from the pulpit that doesn't align with the word of God, God comes first. Always. Matthew 26, 29. I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it anew with you in the Father's kingdom. Jesus abstains from drinking the final cup. We're almost to the Pesach time, the Passover. He abstains from drinking the final cup until we meet again in the Father's kingdom. So Jesus is in a way fasting of the final cup until we can do it together. Think about that for a second. You know, we kind of gloss over the Passover Seder. A couple years in, we're kind of like, oh, and it's just, we're just going to do the same thing over again. Jesus says, like, this, this cup of rejoicing, this cup, like, I'm not going to drink it until we can do it together in the kingdom. He cares enough about us to say, like, I want to wait and do that with you. So Jesus himself sets forth an example of, of there's a time and a place for everything. Yet nothing we can have in this life. No food or drink or, or dopamine hit will ever match the moment that we get to sit in the kingdom with the king of kings and the Lord of Lord and all of this, this evil appetite is gone. Nothing will take the place of that. Gluttony teaches you to live for today while the entire scripture teaches you that you must die today so on the day he comes back, you can live. The counter of the culture. Gluttony induces laziness and laziness brings poverty and poverty induces hopelessness. We find this in Philippians chapter 3 and in Titus chapter 1. But as apprentices of God's creation, we're called to be caretakers of this creation. Through gluttony, we put our desires and our importance ahead of the entire creation. And we make it about us rather than the entire creation of God. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty through 22, Paul had to address this in the church of Corinth where even the Lord's Supper was being exploited by people's selfishness. Never would happen. Therefore, when you meet together, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For you and your eating, each one of you takes his own supper first. I should have waited for this to be the non-kids class week just to read about the Corinth. All the kids during the benediction. Brent's still up here praying for them, and they're out there like, I got to get some buffalo chicken dip. Like, he wasn't talking about buffalo chicken dip. He's talking about the Lord's Supper. But if the shoe fits... And one is hungry and another is drunk. Somebody got drunk off the of communion wine. I'm not saying we shouldn't pay attention to Passover this year. I'm just saying, like, communion wine, Passover wine, there's four cups. You have a cup or two with dinner. It's a lot of wine. Nothing wrong with drinking wine. But if you can't walk out the door, it's a problem. What? Do you not have houses in which to eat and drink? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? Paul goes on to say, I have no praise for you in this. Why not? Because they've taken the blessing of the Lord's Supper, a covenant meal. Something that Jesus gave that we could partake in. And they've turned it into something that they used as selfishness for themselves. It's exactly what our culture tells us is what we should be doing every day here. Take for yourself. Yes, you can. The greatest ever. We, we keep creating these layers where we can be elevated, where we can be extolled, where we can have anything our heart desires. And I'm not saying that America isn't blessed by God and it's not a great land because it is a great land. 
But part of being an American is also understanding that, that we are to try to do right by other people because it was a country that's founded by a whole lot of other people. Germans and Irish, Israelis, Hebrews. As a church, we're called to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, be fathers to the fatherless, and look after the windows. Widows. You can look out the widow, windows while taking care of the widows. I told you, i am been messed up since the beef empanadas. <laughs> be the hands and feet of God. The Holy Spirit will not show up to validate your selfishness. And gluttony is a manifestation of selfishness that impedes the body both physically and spiritually. Worship team, you can come back. This isn't in my notes, but I I was really, really wrestling with it all morning, praying to the Lord. The church has specific callings. As a Christian, you have specific callings. As a follower and an apprentice of Jesus, you have specific callings. Feed the hungry, clothe the naked, be father to the fatherless, and look out the windows and take care of the widows. I have to stay consistent with my screw-ups. Those are consistent callings of the Lord. So please explain to me why When the beauty of the Lord is around us every single day, there's an opportunity to be a witness of Christ to somebody every single day. Please explain to me why we need the drug of false prophecies. We need the drug of biblical fear. There's enough to be fearful around. But yet, when an eclipse comes, oh, Katie, bar the door. Let alone if two of the eight Ninevehs are actually in the path. Yeah, that's right. I know you've seen the Facebook meme. There's eight or ten. Yeah, only two are actually in the full darkness. The rest are kind of on the outside. Didn't tell you that because it doesn't fit the biblical fear. We're gluttonous and overindulgence in fake eschatological things rather than looking around and saying, you know what? How awesome is the creator of the heavens and the earth that he allowed the sun to rise this morning? I actually saw the sunrise coming down uh, uh, of Tecumseh to 60th this morning. This, the sun was huge. Like one of those things you would have seen like from like some of the 80s graphics where like it's just this gigantic, beautiful sun. Why aren't, why aren't we marvelized by that? Why aren't we like in awe of that? Why does it take a blood moon? When every day he makes the moon to rise, and it still happens. We we struggle being consistent in our own life, but yet the Lord can make the moon rise for thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years. But when he turns it a different color, oh, it's the end of the world. Why can't we be gluttonous towards doing right by other people? Zedekiah and righteousness. Why do we have to be gluttonous towards prophecy? Why do we have to be gluttonous towards towards all these other things? In the scripture. Why can't we overindulge in spending our money and putting clothes on naked people? Why can't, we, why, why can't we overindulge ourselves in making sure that, that whatever food we have in our pantry, you have a $500 bill to Costco, which is easy to do with, with some mouse, peanut butter pretzels, if you ever want to give me a gift. <laughs> why aren't we that zealous for putting food in the mouths of other people who don't have food? But well, we're going to worry about the olive tov? Of a, of a solar eclipse? Each one of us has some sort of overindulgence in our life. And it may not be food, it may not be drink. Why can't it be the things that God actually tells us he wants and desires for us? Why are we so desperate to see the Lord come back and predict his date when none of us are ready for him? 
You can say you're ready for him. Yeah, you're ready because you want this to stop. The wrestle and the toil and the work. I'm not perfect. I'll never be perfect. God doesn't expect you to be perfect. He is perfect. He, ex- he expects you to die so that he can live in you. So guys, it's not just what you put in your mouth. It's not what you eat. It's not just what you drink. Sometimes you're overindulging yourself on that dopamine hit of spiritual prophecy or all these other things when God just says, I need you to do the basics. whoop de doo You're 17 years into studying the Bible. You're 40 years in the Bible. Why can't you get this right? Why can't you help this person? Why can't you feed this person? Why can't you clothe this person? You know, all the mysteries unlocked. You've been right no times. You don't want to talk about that. But why can't we do the basics? You know, when we start to think of others, the way that Christ thinks of others, the way Christ thinks of us, it's kind of hard to be gluttonous. It's hard to sit there and look at the person on the street corner in Norman, which is literally out of control. There's homeless people everywhere. It's hard to to drive to Sam's and not stop and say, you know what, I don't need to buy that today because that person might not eat. When you start looking around and you have a heart change for who the Lord has created you to be, knowing that he had grace and his grace was sufficient for you, so his grace is sufficient for them, things change. You want to see the Lord come back? Start preparing the kingdom of God here like he called us to do by placing his desires above our desires. By placing your faith in him, not in what you can eat or you can drink or what you can obtain with your hands. There's nothing you have obtained with your hands that God didn't give you. Nothing in this world dictates your value or your worth. You can, tr- you can strive after it. You can wrestle with it. But it'll be a hole that you'll have to go crawl out of over and over and over again. It will be a well that you will have to keep pulling the water up and drinking from. There's only one place where you can eat and be satisfied. There's only one place that you can drink and be satisfied. There's only one place that you can turn yourself from and have the Lord actually fill that void for you, and that's Him. He is literally the only thing that can fill that void for you. But that takes the death of yourself. It takes walking in humility. It takes putting yourself in a place to realize that the more you overindulge this, the more this grows. We're in the Passover season. In the next 30 days, a little bit of leaven, a little bit of that will puff up everything. I, I told on myself, I'm a peanut butter pretzel guy. Eat a couple peanut butter pretzels and then go drink a big glass of water. One is healthy for you, the other is not. What happens in your stomach? Like I only had like five. Because it puffs up. It fills up. Every person in this room has something in their life. At some point in time, there's some hurt, there's some trauma, there's some overindulgence, there's something. Everybody has it. So before we get to the spring feast this year, how do we actually clean out our closet? I don't care how many crumbs you have in your couch. I honestly don't think the Lord does either. I think he's more worried about how many little sin nuggets and crumbs of sin you have in your actual heart and your mind. So we go through the physical process of like, well, I'm gonna get a feather duster out and I'm gonna check and see if I left a crumb and inevitably sometime you get in your wife's car, it's never in your own car. She's not here, she can't defend herself. You get in your wife's car, and there's a little piece of leather. I 
I don't care how in detail you go into your couches and under your rugs and that to clean that out. If you're not looking in your heart, you're not looking in your mind, you're not looking into that, that portion of you, that, 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 that appetite in you, that, that evil appetite that wants to take the Lord out of you, and you're purging that out. Because you can keep going through the process in the physical life all you want. But one of the most awesome things about the new covenant in Jesus is that he says it's no longer going to be some tablet, some list, some journal. I'm going to write it here. And I'm going to put a new spirit in here so that would affect how you think, how you feel, how you speak, how you walk. We're going to sing a, call, a song called Jealous. Pat on repeat. It says, he's a jealous God for us. He's jealous for me. God is jealous for you. When he sees you committing adultery with Facebook, Rather than spending time with him, he's mad. When he sees you going to the restaurant to fill yourself up, when, when he's like, I just needed to fill, I had the power to fill you up, he's mad. He's jealous. He wants to spend that time with you. He wants to be intimate with you. He wants to heal you. He wants to set you free. He wants to put his word on your heart. He is jealous for you because he loves you more than you love yourself. I don't know a lot of like super cool things, but I know one thing. A God who is willing to take on this, this, He's willing to take on this suit of flesh because he loved us so much that he wanted us to be set free. He was willing to leave the perfect atmosphere of heaven and earth to come here and take on a temple of flesh and bone that was imperfect so that we could be set free. That's a love I don't, I don't know I know how to have. And all throughout all the covenants, the covenant with Moses, the covenant with David, over and over and over again, when the enemies of Israel tried to kill them, tried to annihilate them, and God would step in and do what he said he was going to do. He was going to honor his oath. He was going to honor the covenant. And then they turn right around and like, thank you for saving me. I'm going to go back and do it again. Day. Don't just think back to what God did in saving the Israelite people and saving the Jewish people. Allow God to permeate your heart. And anything in your heart or your mind that is an overindulgence of something that is not of Him, allow Him to put those on the gallows and kill them. so that he can fill that with the power and the presence of his love, his grace, his mercy, and his Holy Spirit. Let's worship.